三米切换。Sing for joy to God, our strength. Shout aloud to the God of Jacob. Begin the music. Strike the tambourine. Play the melodious harp and lyre. Sound the ram's horn at the new moon, and when the moon is full on the day of our feast, this is a decree for Israel, an ordinance of the God of, of, the God of Jacob. He established it as a statute for Joseph. When he went out against Egypt, where we heard a language we did not understand, he says, "I remove the burden from their shoulders; their hands were set free from the basket." In your distress, you called, and I rescued you. I answered you out of a thundercloud. I tested you at the waters of Meribah, Sela. Hear, O、oh、my people, and I will warn you. If you would but listen to me, O Israel, you shall have no foreign god among you. You shall not bow down to an alien god. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out <coughs> up out of Egypt. Open wide your mouth, and I will fill it. But my people would not listen to me. Israel would not submit to me. So I gave them over to the stubborn hearts to follow their own devices. If my people would not but listen to me, if Israel would follow my ways, how quickly would I subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their foes? Those who hate the Lord would cringe before Him, and their punishment would last forever. But you would be fed with the finest of wheat, with honey from the rock. I would satisfy you. Thanks, Karen. Just invite Pastor Shelley to come up and bring the message. Can you hear me? That's good, because as we look at this psalm, the question that we're going to consider in response to it is: Are you listening? When we listen, there's an unspoken assumption that there will be a response. So, for example, if I'm expecting guests, I listen for their car so that I can respond when they come and go and greet them, or. When a parent gives a child an instruction, suppose I said,、um, "Collect all the garbage and put it out in the bin and take it out to the roadside," I would expect that they would listen, and that garbage would be down by the roadside at the right time. But I see you laughing because it doesn't always work that way, does it? I think if we're all honest. There are times when every single one of us haven't listened and have responded, haven't responded in the way that has been expected or the way that was expected. I wonder, have you ever listened and then regretted not following the instruction? Has that ever happened to you? Or maybe you've been the one who's given the instruction. And you'd wished that someone else would have listened, and that makes me、um, remember a time in one of my children、um, when they were young, about seven or eight, and for homework they were told that they had to write out their spelling words three times for homework so that they would know their words, and they argued that they didn't need to do that because they knew how to spell the words. So the teacher said, "That's all right." But she made an agreement. Actually, she wrote a contract with this child of mine, and the agreement was: No, you do not have to write these words out. But if you get any wrong, then you will write each one out ten times. Well, you can imagine what happened. I, I know that teacher was probably thinking, if only they had listened. 
because actually he didn't just get a few wrong, he got about six or seven of them wrong. And so it, he regretted that he had not listened. And in this Psalm 81, three times we hear that same idea. We hear the heartfelt words of the Father warning and saying, Oh, that my people would listen. We'll look at specifically um, what we're being instructed to listen to, and we're going to look at how that, what that looks like in our culture today. This psalm is a song, and in the same way as when we sang that song before, How Deep the Father's Love for Us, it's meant to focus our attention on a specific subject that results in a heart response. So when you sang those songs, your attention focused on our father and his son and how he died on the cross, and there was a response, I imagine. There was in me. And in the same way, that's what this song is meant to do. So as we look at it, just keep that in mind. We want to think of, so where is our attention in this song? The focus of our attention is to be on the heartfelt yearning of our loving father who wants his best for his children. And the response is to listen and to obey. It may interest you to know that the writer of this psalm, Asap, or Asaph, was not only was he a skilled writer of songs, but he was also a prophet. And I believe that's what is reflected in this song, the fact that he was a prophet, because in it is a message from God given to Asaph so that he can warn his people, warn God's people. And the first part of the song begins with words intended to draw our attention to a particular time in history. And unbeknownst to me, I didn't know that they were looking at the commandments and spoke about what happened at Mount Sinai, but that's where we're looking. That's where our mind is going. When God rescued the Israelites from Egypt, and in the same way that a trumpet plays Revali, um, the same way that that was to signal the military to rise up at, at dawn, so too in this psalm we hear the reference of a trumpet blowing at the new moon. And that was to signal a most sacred time in the Jewish calendar. And the most popular belief is that that was what is called the Feast of Trumpets, or of, uh, uh, I mean, the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths. And we hear the words in that psalm, sing aloud, shout for joy, sound the tambourine. And we know that it is a joyous celebration. And verses 4 and 5 tell us that God had decreed it. So that meant that this feast <clears throat> was held annually to commemorate the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he had done in rescuing the Israelites from Egypt. And also, it was to remember God's provision marking the end of the harvest year. So each year, the families would set up their tents and they had special activities that they would do to remember that their forefathers had lived in tents for 40 years in the wilderness. And I wonder... When you hear about that, does your mind go to the amazing stories of the rescue? I mean, straight away, I bet you're thinking of, of the plagues and of, of the rescue going through, um, going through the Red Sea, the waters parted, and the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire that led them, and the provision of food and water, and the thunder and the lightning at the mountain, and the voice of God speaking. All of those things were in their memory. However, although our attention is drawn to that feast, there is very little mention of those things. Rather, 
the psalm focuses on bringing a warning to God's people, recalling that their forefathers didn't listen. Didn't listen to God in verse 8. Listen to me, O my people, while I give you a stern warning. O Israel, or it could be O Gimpy Wesleyan Methodist Church, if you would only listen to me. And just like the people who were living in the time when that psalm was written, we too face the problem of trying to listen to God while living in an adulterous world. From the time that Adam and Eve first decided not to listen, but listen to the God of this world, listen to Satan, man has been idolatrous. Putting our trust in or seeking satisfaction in self as God or something else other than God. And to this world, when we talk about an invisible God who satisfies our needs, that, that's ludicrous. That makes no sense to them. With the repetition of, oh, that my people would listen, the psalmist draws our attention to the heartfelt longing of our Father. And if you have ever loved, if you have ever yearned for a loved one to listen, then you can relate. If you have ever, maybe in your family there's been a destructive relationship, maybe somebody in your family has gone on a destructive pathway and your relationship is broken with them, then you can understand the yearning of the Father. And so from this understanding, that's how we are to listen to this instruction. And the question that we should ask in response to the psalm is, what about us? What about me? Am I willing to listen to this instruction? And the, and the instruction was, there shall be no strange God among you. You shall not bow down to a foreign God. When God spoke to the people in the wilderness, he made it very clear that he was a jealous God and that his people were to have no other gods. <clears throat> it's the first of the Ten Commandments, the first two, actually, of the Ten Commandments, which were given to the Israelites. And when we think of... of what happened in the wilderness? Maybe our minds go to the story of the golden images or that the golden calf or Nebuchadnezzar when he made the image and said they had to bow down to that. While we may not bow down to images, Scripture teaches that idolatry is a matter of a divided heart. Have no other gods. God only it says there's only to be me, not a there's not to be divided between others. Jesus in Mark twelve thirty, when answering the question, what is the most important commandment? Reflecting this commandment, he said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind and with all your strength. You know, sometimes we might, we might want to just rattle that off and take that word all out, but the writer puts that in to emphasize the point that it's everything, it's all. There's not one part of it missed out. God wants an undivided heart. And Matthew 6.24 gives this example of an undivided heart and also of an idol. It says... No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. 
in the scriptures, there's much teaching about things that take first place, things that lead to this divided heart. James 4 says, James 4, 4 says, Do you know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? So, for example, sport. Would we rather go to a game than, than serve God? Would we rather go to a game than spend time with God? Would we rather watch TV than do what God wants us to do? Sport, fashion, wealth, sex, education, self-image, even family and our home can become our gods. And it's not to say, hear me, this is definitely not to say that any of those things in themselves are bad. They are not. However, when things or people are given first place, when they rather then God and his word determines how we live, how we spend our money, how we spend our time, then they have become our gods. They are our masters. That reminds me of the movie Chariots of Fire. I'm sure many, many of you have seen it. And it tells the story of the man Eric Liddell, the runner who withdrew from his place in the Olympic heats because it was on a Sunday. His commitment to his sport came second, came second place to his first commitment to God. The writer of Hebrews warns, keep your life free from love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. I know there's a warning, but it also remembers what we're weighing up beside it is that Jesus has said he, will, he is always there to satisfy our need. Can we trust him or is our trust misplaced? Now, this was a question Jeff and I were talking about. Let's think about that. Adam and Eve were given an instruction, but they decided to listen to someone else, to trust someone else and to put their trust in themselves. Their trust was misplaced. Or what about those Israelites who built the golden calf? Or, or what about when God said, go in and take the land, take the promised land? And they said, no. Their trust wasn't in God. It was in their own abilities and that the others were stronger than them. And it makes me think, where in our lives is our trust misplaced? For example, Do we depend, does success depend on our own abilities? Something isn't going to succeed if we haven't got the abilities. Or do we go, this may happen, but God is in control. Do we trust him for the outcome? Do we trust in our own knowledge? Do we trust in our own strength, our own wealth, for example? Remember how God provided for Adam and Eve? There wasn't a thing that they needed. And interesting, remember how he provided for the Israelites in the wilderness. Not only those, the the food and the water, but there's a scripture that says their sandals never wore out and their clothes never wore out. You know, it is a big challenge. Do we trust God? Can we trust him to satisfy all of our needs? Scripture says in Luke 12, 29 to 20, and do not set your heart, notice it's about the heart, on what you eat or drink. Do not worry about it, for the pagan world runs after all such things, and your father knows that you need them. 
hearing that we are to have no other gods, it's not a new message. However, the fact that throughout the Bible, this same message is repeated over and over and over. And because we live in an adulterous and in an idolatrous world, it may be a message we've heard, but we need to heed it today. We need to go home and ask ourselves, God, is there some idols? Is there some way that we have a divided heart? As 1 Peter 5, 8 advises, we need to be sober-minded and watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Considering the schemes of the devil in the world, maybe the question we need to ask is, who and what are we listening to? Are we listening to God or are we listening to the world? In this psalm, we cannot help but remember the generation that missed out on what God had for them because they didn't listen. And when we think about all the glorious, all the amazing, all the powerful things that were done for them while in the wilderness, it almost seems inconceivable that they didn't listen and that they didn't trust him. And yet, that's what happened. They missed out on all that he wanted for them. But to those who do listen, in verse 10, we have this beautiful picture and promise. It says, open your mouth wide and I will fill it. There's a verse to take home and meditate on. Picture a bird. When it opens its mouth wide, always waiting and expecting its hunger to be satisfied. It doesn't question, it expects its hunger to be satisfied. Are we willing to, as it were, open our mouth wide? Do we want all God has for us? Or do we close our mouth tight? The degree to which we listen and obey God's word relates directly to the extent to which God is able to transform our lives into his image. Let me say that again. The degree to which we listen and obey God's word directly relates to the extent to which God is able to transform our lives into his image. To listen and obey, we need to be in a position to hear. We need to, be in a, we need to be in his word. We need to be mixing with people who can teach us. God, from the time of man's fall, has always been working to restore his relationship with him. He's always been wanting to fill us, but in this psalm, hear his lament. But my people did not listen to my voice. Verse 13 says that those who don't listen and submit, he gives up to their own stubborn ways. And while we might think, oh, we would love to have our own way because that's what the world tells us, we know that being left to our own devices, mankind has only spiralled downhill. Romans 1, 18.32, tells us that those people who God gave up to their own stubborn ways became futile in their thinking because they exchanged the truth for a lie. They exchanged the truth about God 
for a lie, and they worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator. They were given up to the lusts of their hearts, to impurity, to dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they didn't listen. The psalm stands as a stern warning. It is what it is. And today, will we learn and will we listen? Will we learn from the mistake of the Israelites who knew God's power, knew his care, knew his provision, and yet they did not trust in him? It is a reminder that just as God rescued the Israelites, he also rescued us through Jesus Christ and and his death and resurrection. And we must remember that in that rescue, he's given us his Holy Spirit that we might be changed within, that we might have the power, that we might have a change of desired hearts. We are a different people. The focus of Psalm 81 is to draw our attention to the longing of our God. Oh, that my people would listen. The purpose of the psalm is to call his people to faithfulness, to respond by listening and obeying. Listening and obeying these commandments is fundamental and foundational. It is that by which our lives hang in the balance. The God of heaven and earth wants us to be free, not to be held to the captivity of sin and death. So the question that we have to ask ourselves, are the gods of the world taking first place in our lives? Will we go home and pray about it? Will we look at his word and seek to listen? The Israelites missed out on entering God's rest. The question we must answer, we must consider, is who will we listen to and obey? Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you are a patient God. I thank you that you remind us over and over. I thank you that you provide your Holy Spirit and that you make us your children. And today, as we consider what you have said to us, I pray that we would not let this be a word that just is so familiar that we go, I know that, and that doesn't apply. I ask by your Spirit that you would speak to each one of our hearts that we would be transformed into your likeness. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Pastor Shelley.